everyone could please take their seats. We're going to get started in just a minute. Hi, good morning, uh, and welcome to the Center for Global Development. My name is Michelle Denevers, and I'm here uh, in place of Nancy Birdsall, who unfortunately had a last-minute issue and was not able to be with us this morning as much as she would like to. Um, I just want to welcome you all to the Center for Global Development, and thank you so much for coming this morning for what we are looking forward to as a really important talk. I don't know how much all of you know about the Center for Global Development, but we are a small think tank that focuses on development issues, and particularly on improving the behavior and actions of the rich and powerful countries as they affect what we say is the poor and powerless countries. Uh, so we look at, at how donors and other um, actors in, in the uh, more affluent parts of the world should behave and how their policies and behaviors affect poor countries. And that is why this session on uh, and the work program that we have on red and forests is particularly important because climate change for us is very much motivated by the idea that it is a development issue, that the gains in development over the last 30 and 40 years can be uh, significantly reduced by the impacts of climate change and that those impacts affect uh, more the poorest and most vulnerable countries in the world. And so uh, for us, climate is very much a development issue. Within that, forests are a natural and very important link between climate development um, and uh, actions both for mitigation and adaptation. And so uh, at this point, forests are really at the center of CGD's program on climate change. We do other work in climate finance. Our colleagues have written a book called Green Print on looking at the negotiations. We do work on energy, um, carbon emissions, uh, various other parts of climate. But at this point, forests, climate, and Red Plus are at the center of our climate program here in CGD. Um, we are very happy to be collaborating with climate advisors, our colleagues uh, up the street, and have been for about a year and a half as part of this project, looking at RED and looking at how we can increase and encourage more support on the part of both public and private financiers in, in rich countries to come forth and try to encourage and provide support and funding for tropical forest countries to reduce their emissions from deforestation. So this is a really a big part of our program here in CGD, and we're happy to have you all with us this morning um, for an interesting program. Now, I would like to first start by introducing Francis Seymour, whom I am sure in this crowd needs no introduction, probably in most crowds doesn't. But Francis is now a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development in Washington. I take personal credit for having found her as she was leaving C uh, C4 in Indonesia and uh, tried to grab her before somebody else had pinned her down. Uh, she's also an advisor on a number of other different um, climate and forest related uh, activities, as you know. And from 2006 to 2012, she was the Director General of the Center for International uh, Forest Research, uh, which is headquartered in Indonesia, and Francis has a long career working on forest and climate and development issues. So I will turn over to Francis, and she will take over the program from here. So welcome. Thank you. Well, thanks to Michelle for an overly generous uh, introduction of me, um, but it is my pleasure to introduce His Excellency, Mr. Hero Prasetyo. Um, Pat Hero, as you know from your program, was recently appointed as the first head of the new RED agency in Indonesia, and this is a ministerial level appointment, uh, hence the new Excellency title that I'm getting used to. Um, Pat Heru, as you will see in the, the presentation he's about to give you, the task that he has before him is a very management intensive task. And uh, so fortunately, Pat Heru has a professional management background uh, in his training. 
and before he entered public service was um, a senior person in Accenture in Indonesia. So he's got those those management credentials. Um, but he came into public service and is is best known for um, his role on the team with Contoro Manco Subroto in managing the Aceh tsunami uh, relief um, uh, many years ago. And for those of you who don't know Indonesia, this team was sort of an iconic team with a reputation for sort of technocratic efficiency, competence, and integrity. And they managed to simultaneously knock heads across departments within Indonesia and knock heads across donor agencies internationally to mobilize a lot of money and use it effectively uh, in that context. So um, perhaps it was not a surprise that that team then uh, came into the president's office as part of something called the Presidential Delivery Unit, the Ukape Empat, um, which was had enormous amount of tasks and sort of overall um, supervision and monitoring of the various um, sectoral ministries, but was also given the, the task of managing the Red Plus Task Force. And Pat Heru, as a deputy in the Ukape Empat, um, was a member of that task force. So had has had lots of op um, responsibilities related to implementation of that, that workload within Indonesia, but has also been very um, uh, active internationally, and so has, for example, co-chaired the Red Plus Partnership and been an active participant in various conferences of the parties of the UNFCCC. And I can tell you that one of my colleagues, who will not be named, described Pat Heru's role at one of the negotiations as being on roller skates. So that gives you an idea of how effective uh, this guy uh, can play in those circles. And I just want to say that, you know, uh, from a personal perspective as well as um, on behalf of CGD and Climate Advisors, we are well aware of just how much is on Pat Heru's and Pat Willie's and other members of the delegation's plates in Jakarta, as well as in places like Palankaraya, where I know Pat Heru was as recently as last Friday. And so it's really an honor that they would have taken the time out of that busy uh, set of responsibilities and schedules to get on a plane across the Pacific and come spend some time with us to tell us what's going on. So I'm sure um, that you all share with me some excitement about hearing um, what Pat Heru has to say, and um, I will now leave the floor to you, His, His Excellency, Mr. Hero Prosecchio. Thank you, Francis, and thank you, Michelle. It's a pleasure and honor, and because of that, good morning, and thank you very much for being here with me today. This is the Center for Global Development. Francis mentioned that before taking Red Plus agency in a task force, I was in the President's Delivery Unit for Development, Monitoring, and Supervision, and Oversight. So we are on the same page when you're talking about development. On the other hand, now I'm moving into Red Plus, and a very big emphasis that the center is putting on climate change is actually another shake hand that we can have. So I'm feeling that this is like a, I don't know if this is a future home for me or if I'm accepted uh, later on when the, I got to my next retirement. And Francis mentioned I'm the first head of this. When you're mentioning about the first, there seems to be an implication of a second. There seems to be an implication of a third, of a fourth and forever, because I think this agency needs to be there for a long time in Indonesia, because the agenda of climate change being uh, a global problem that needs global solution will also need something that is not necessarily forever as forever, but also taking quite significant time to make it really give impact for the planet that we have been uh, trying to nurture so far. It was very interesting uh, when we heard about the rich country and the poor country that Michelle mentioned. I would like to say it like the children, the child country, and the adult country. And children normally play and grow and make themselves very strong. And when they do that, maybe they somehow uh, create some havoc to their gardens because they are running hide and seek and playing and growing. Uh, and uh, the adult will say, all right, go to the right track because that is not acceptable anymore now. 
We need to keep our garden alive. But all countries has gone through that. All countries in the world has gone through the childhood, adolescent, and then the, and the adult life. Indonesia, in this case, ladies and gentlemen, in my view, is moving into the adolescent side. It's not a child anymore, but it's not an adult in full for that development kind of a pattern. So maybe there will be some uh, perspective that will be interesting, at least from me, for me to realize that where are we? We are not in the adult group, but we are not also in the child group. So that is the middle track that we are in right now. I would like to, this morning, given the opportunity to report to you the progress of Red Plus in Indonesia, our challenges and our progress. And hopefully at the end, you'll be able to conclude whether Red Plus is something that will be significantly useful to protect Indonesia's forest, as the title of the invitation gives. Let's see first the challenge that we have in Indonesia for Red Plus uh, for that matter. Can we go to the next slide? Who is controlling my slide? Or do I, oh, I have to control it myself? <laughs> I, no, no, I can do that, no problem. <laughs> I just thought that my staff is actually clicking that for me. This is a picture, ladies and gentlemen, of the situation of the forest of Indonesia, 1950. You have the whole Kalimantan, which is one of the large islands that Indonesia have, one of the five large islands that Indonesia have, still very green. 2010, the picture is a little bit uh, not green. And if we project that until 2020, the condition is even worse. That is the trend of the situation of the forest in Indonesia. And I'm talking about forest as in forest cover, not necessarily what the government of Indonesia define forest for administrative purposes and for the real uh, biophysical cover. So this is the forest cover kind of picture. Now, in 2011, when we have our moratorium announced, the Ministry of Forestry gave us this map. The map on the side shows the cover, forest cover of Indonesia on 2010, or 2011 for that matter. But then when we ask, all right, what part of that forest already given license to companies? And they plot the licenses into the forest, and what is not licensed to, in Indonesia's forests are only the, those things that sh looks like uh, Dalmatians. Okay, so very small dots. Of course, you can say that this is if, if everybody who has the license on the forest cut the forest dry, clean, then that will be the picture. Of course, those who has the license has not cut them. And also, those licenses, as well as the area that we call the national park and other things, will still have forests on top of it. So the challenge that we have right now is not to move from this to that side, to that map, but to protect and minimize the shift from this to that. Because not only the forest is covered by trees, but this is also the forest in terms of being our treasure chest. The biodiversity that Indonesia have is very rich. Like 25% uh, of the fish in the world is actually coming from Indonesia. Birds, we have 17% of the birds and all those things. Talking about biodiversity, you can talk a lot, not only what is on the land, but also on the, uh, in the sea. But not only that, if we consider what is the forest for and what is the forest function is, we can also say that within the forest, we still have and will continue to have a dead community living in the forest itself. Okay, the custom-based community living in the forest. So the challenge with that is basically to say, how can we keep our forest standing? And another secret that the land of Indonesia have is peat, peat land. Okay. In 2006, the Indonesian the Ministry of Environment provided the second communications, national communication to UNFCCC. And in that number, there is a projection by 2020, 
the emission of Indonesian CO2 equivalent is going to be 2.9 gigaton. Out of that, like 63% will come from forestry and peat, plus agriculture. 60% on forestry and peat, and like additional 3% from agriculture at that projection. Now, when you're talking about the forestry and peat having 60%, we ask ourselves, what is the size of the forest cover of Indonesia, theor theoretically? And people answer, I mean, my friends in C4 answer me, 120 million hectares, Heru, approximately. All right. And then within that 120 million hectares, there is an 18 million hectares of peat. Now, if peat has seven times emission uh, factor compared to the, uh, the, what you call it, the mineral soil forest, then that 18 million hectares actually have a carbon stock that is even bigger than the total mineral soil for forest. So you're talking about the double the size, the impact of emissions of the forests of Indonesia to the real coverage in terms of hectare because of the factor of peat. Now, having have that in terms of our, in, in our plate, remember this is 2006, before the 2007 COP13 in Bali, whereby Red Plus becomes something that is being discussed in full seriousness. And then when we look into that and we have the standard things that you all know about what is UNFCCC Red Plus definition, which I will not read because you have known that in the back of your hand, we say that this is not enough. If we are talking only about this and everything is denominated by the gigatons and whatever tonnage of carbon emissions as being the, the currency being used, no, that is not enough. So when we get into the Red Plus Initiative Indonesia, please understand that what our definition of Red Plus is beyond carbon and more than forest. We are talking about livelihood of the communities. We are talking about the biodiversity and we are talking about the ecosystem services that is provided by the forest itself. Now, it's not going to be two details on that, but all the details is being analyzed and say that for us, the problem of the forest is not only a reduction of emission. Let me give you an example why it is so. If you're talking about reduction of emission alone, then the first low-hanging fruit or the most effective intervention is going to be on the peatland because this has seven times the emission compared to the other thing. Now, if we concentrate and no touching of the peatland, and we need to develop and we need to grow, just like the children that grows into adolescents and grow into the playing ground of the adults, okay, just like the other countries, then what happens is that we will cut the forest on the, on the mineral soil. Let's, pre let's protect the peatland and let's sacrifice the mineral soil if only emission is the agenda. So we say no, because the mineral soil has much more to offer in the case of non-carbon benefits. Okay, so we need to cover both at the same time. Now, having that as the basis of our definition, we'll now say commitment, commitment, commitment. In September 2009, for the year of 2020 in our mind, we say the President of Indonesia said that we will reduce our emission from business as usual because it matters for us by 26%. Matter for Indonesia, 26%. But we also realize that what we can do will contribute to the fight against climate change of the global community. And so, because it matters for the world, question mark, is it true? Is it something that only Indonesia say or think or, or maybe being uh, arrogant saying we have enough contribution that we can do, uh, it's going to contribute to the world? And we will add 15% to make it 41%. But the world needs to justify our love, <laughs> which means that, all right, if you think that this is really good for the world, 
you must be willing to contribute to us. And if you are willing to contribute to us, we are going to hit the 41%. So it's actually just like in any uh, kind of a good relationship, there is something that I am giving if it is going to be acceptable. If it's going to be acceptable by the word, yes, we are going to do that. And here comes Norway, making commitment in 2010. Yes, it matters for the word. And they promise one billion payment for results. Now, when you're talking about payment for results, it's just like saying, all right, guys, you're in that small island that's going to sing, and you can save the world, swim to other to other side of the sea. When you get to that shore, we are going to give you the award. Payment for results. If you can cross the strait. If you can cross the strait, we'll give you the award. But these people don't know how to swim. So you're saying that, so the 75 countries or whatever the number of countries that can save the world by saving their forests cannot swim to that other side. Payment for result, if that is the logic of payment for result, it's not going to work. So Norway is very, very open in terms of our discussion. All right, Paheru, for Indonesia, we are going to provide you the resources that you can learn how to swim. So the initial part, the 30 million part, the 170 million part of the transition before we are getting to the payment for, for results was actually teaching us how to swim. And we are now swimming, we are now learning how to swim, and we face the strait, and we realize that the strait is full of sharks. <laughs> so we need the shark repellent as well, okay? The shark repellent part will come later on as a request. Now, that is the logic, okay? That's the logic of our relationship and our commitment and our promise to the world, okay? And then what happened is that after a long process of two and a half years, three years perhaps, the birth of the Red Plus Agency is already on. That was last year, 2013, the Red Plus Agency was established through the presidential regulations and uh, it seems that the president is finding a little bit difficulties in uh, really concentrating on who will be best to run this agency and give the responsibility to me. You have made your promise, Heru, you deliver. Wow, all right, that is another chapter of the fight. It is another chapter of the, the struggle. So this is the institutional setup of the Red Plus Agency. It has a ministerial level head, and that's why, like Francis mentioned, this is my first time that I'm uh, using that H and E in front of my name. So jokingly, I said that uh, that is Heru Eko Prasetyo. <laughs> but anyway, that is the Red Plus Agency, a ministry level head. Why? Because we need to coordinate and consolidate the many activities done by different ministries along that line that in the past has not been coordinated well such that it will deliver something solid as a result. Activities in the Ministry of Forestry is a lot. Activities in the Ministry of Environment is a lot. Activities within the Ministry of Public Works on the spatial plan is a lot. But they are not coordinated. So it go cross purposes and it's not supporting and not strengthening the effort to reduce emission. It has to be corrected. And for that, you need to be able to coordinate the work of the ministers. But not only ministers, we need to also make use of the network that was already there, 40 demonstration activities already there when the task force uh, for Red Plus was actually starting doing. And that is because of the support that is provided by our partners in the world. All right, so we need to also coordinate those efforts in a way that we'll be able to do that. Once it is already being done, coordination, direction provided, I'm responsible directly to the president. And then at that time, we will now say, all right, if that is now the coordination that's already been done and moving forward, we will be able to fund the projects that is talking about Red Plus, the coordinated Red Plus projects, right? The coordinated Red Plus project. But how do you fund that? People say, okay, go through the government budget. We go through the government budget, then the problem is like any other country, the government budget may not be tailored for Red Plus. 
terminology is, may not be there, and because of that, the chart of accounts is not conducive for that, the bureaucracy is too slow, and because of that, you need to have a funding instrument that will be responsive, quick, accountable, and professionally done. And the second, all this will connect to the international world only if you have trust. And trust means that you are reporting something that can be verified, transparent, and because of that, we need the MR fee unit. Okay, so these are the two things, the funding instrument and the uh, MR fee unit that needs to be established there. Now, having said that, I will say you, told you tell you now how the transition from the preparation, preparation phase, transformation phase, and that later on, contribution to verified in, uh, emissions is being done. So just a snapshot that this is the process that this agency has gone through to get where we are today. Now, when we get into this position now, the question is, now the agency is operational, now the agency must do activity on the ground instead of just designing and planning. So what will be your result framework? How do you frame your result such that we can do payment for result with a full confidence that is already being planned up front that the result is not going haywire into other areas, okay? Remember that this is a climate change issue, which is a development issue, and the agenda can be very wide. So we provided a research framework whereby we have two outcomes that we will have to achieve. Indonesia has the institutional and operational capacity to implement large-scale performance-based Red Plus program and reports on emissions. This has to be done by the end of 2016, and this is what we are working now in terms of building into that capacity. And the second, Indonesia implements program for reduced emission from main greenhouse gas emission sources by addressing drivers of deforestation and land degradation while maintaining the carbon stock, basically the red plus things. And then we say that the output number one, output number two, now output number three, uh, four, and five is being put into our result framework that will direct how the agency is going to be running moving forward. I can report, ladies and gentlemen, that at this moment, using this result framework in our mind, that the progress, we are now operational in 11 provinces in Indonesia. Indonesia has 34 provinces. Indonesia has 500 plus, or, uh, uh, around 500 districts. See, when the Red Plus Task Force is operational, the pilot province is Kalimantan Tengah. And then, before getting into the agency, we have the UKP4 Red Plus Special Team that covers uh, the other area. And then now, the, the Red Plus Agency will cover those 11 provinces and in 2015, we are expanding to the 34 other, pro the other uh, 23 provinces to make it 34 at the end. And we only operate in 11 provinces. I don't know how it is done in Brazil, but if you're talking about Brazil being Amazon area, if we are only doing 11 and put that equal to Amazon, what will happen is that people in the parliament will say, you are not working for the Indonesia in total. So the parliament will continuously pressure us to work in 34 provinces, because that is where Indonesia, what Indonesia is. So for the operation of this, we are taking steps to prepare Red Plus implementation at provincial level, and we have these five imperatives or five prerequisites for the province to do that. Why are we concentrating on province? Because we know that if we do that at the national level, we will not be very different than the world that is talking at the global level. Action is actually on the ground. So we need to get to the ground. And the ground is jurisdictionally under the district, and the district is under the province. So we are operating at the sub-national level to make sure that what we are talking at the national level is actually resonate with what is going on on the ground. So this is the importance. I think this is very important for any country who wants to implement Red Plus in earnest. You don't implement Red Plus at the national level. You implement Red Plus from the ground up. And because of that, we are 
talking about this prerequisite for a province to be able to get this mandate to run the Red Plus in their organization, in their province, and also for the district. You have the strategy, you need to have the map, you have the institution to do that, you have the memorandum of understanding with us in the national level so that consistency can be maintained, and you have to do an MRV in your sub-national level that we can aggregate at the national level. So that a report to the world that is actually not a report coming from Jakarta, but is coming from the villages that goes to Jakarta as just a terminal to move into the world. We are on track in the implementation of Red Plus at the provincial level. And those provincial, five provinces now and 29 districts is now embarking on these 11 imperatives in line for the implementation of Red Plus in Indonesia. We are monitoring of the moratorium. You remember that in 2011, Indonesia declared moratorium for two years and it expand, extended with the president in 2013 until 2015, and that moratorium covers some hectares that we will protect. That's number one. License review and gazettement of the forest area. If you are not knowing what is the map, the real map, we will be like Alice when he's asking to the Cheshire cat, okay, where am I? Where do you want to go? I don't know, so every direction is correct. Now, we have to have the proper map. We have to have the proper direction with the map is on the hand. So, license review and gazettement of the forest area is part of clarifying what is the boundary of the forest, etc. We need to support the law enforcement effort, mapping, forest fire management and prevention. This is a big time because if we know that the forest carbon is creating those emissions, it is big, one of the iconic one of the iconic proof of that is when Indonesia have the forest fire in 97. So big is the fire that it breaks the ozone. It was taken from the sky, and that is so much of a, wow, this is really what is meant by emission that is coming from the forest. Now, because of that, we have the forest fire management in control, not in control, but in our plan, and we are working on that. We create green village for livelihood. We create a green school to make people learn from the beginning and the support the spatial plan, conflict resolution, and a strategic program for national park and protected areas. Let me give you the picture of how the coordination of the ministries needs to be done continuously. 2011, we create the forest moratorium. At the time, the map shows, look at the data at the back at the bottom, shows 69.144 million hectares being protected by the moratorium. This is primary forest and peatland. After that, when we move into the six months later, when we review the map, discussing with other ministries, we get the information that actually 3.6 million hectares needs to be taken out because it was already licensed by the Ministry of Agriculture. So the map that is coming out from the Ministry of Forestry is the total honest map from the Ministry of Forestry. On the 13th of, uh, on the year, uh, on the 11, uh, month 11 of the 2013, we get the size turning down into 64,701. It's just like your bank account being taken small, piece by small piece after a year because the data was not there. Now we have this data and we have now the basis. Everybody, have you already recorded your claim into this land? Yes, key and close that and this is what we are going to control now, moving forward. Problem is that some district is still providing licenses. Now when they are pro still providing licenses, it means that it's not following the direction of the president. And so we can deal with that in a way that is proper for that purpose. We are also acquiring or developing one database on forestry, plantation, and mining license nationally. We are developing, not just acquiring, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for that words of acquiring there. 
And we are also completing the large scale base map on Sumatra and now moving improvement of Kalimantan. What we are talking about large scale here, most of the map of Indonesia at the national level is worth 250,000 to one scale. One to 250,000 scale. That's not good enough. At the province level, it has to be a minimum of one to 50,000. We have developed that for the five provinces and we are now expanding to the 11 provinces as well. That will give us more detail. But not only that, we also acquired a capacity that we will be able to monitor the forest fire. And every month we are now getting a report from our satellite agency, LAPAN, that we provide them with equipment to do that of the conditions of the hotspots in Indonesia. So every day at the afternoon, we get this report on our handphone so that we'll be able to monitor what's going on. We look forward that by July, maybe the El Nino is going to strike again for Indonesia and the potential for forest fire will go up. And now we are working with the coordinating minister for uh, social affairs, which is mandated by the president to control the forest fire that we will be able to anticipate and per perhaps do some preparation stage before the, the heat gets uh, hit Indonesia next. That sounds like that we are doing it more technical. We are doing it more like uh, coming from the sky, but not true. We also work with the Aman. We are working with the uh, community on the ground, the uh, customer custom base communities to develop uh, SOP in terms of how do we do participatory mapping. And we provide the application. And we are, and I can report very, very proudly that the work that we are doing as an agency with the community of the Masyarakat Adat, of the custom-based community, uh, is quite well rolling. And uh, maps that is prepared by the the uh, community themselves is already put into the one map agenda of the country. This is, I think, the first time that the participatory community mapping is putting in, put into the national one map agenda. We do the baseline mapping and we created as well indicative national reference emission level. The approach that we are using is basically uh, historical average, and the three elements of emission that we are identifying as our most important element. And that is, number one, you're talking about the forest, the de deforestation, and then peat decomposition, and then forest fire, and peat fire, all right? These three element is a source of this emission, and we make, uh, uh, historical average approach, and we come up with those number. This is the first number that we are going to do public consultation or expert consultation to get into one number that is going to be used later on. Okay, this is something that we start as our straw man and for uh, further discussion. We hope that by the end of 2015, we'll be able to declare that this is the number that we're going to use to measure 2016 so that by the end of 2016, we can achieve what the result framework has told us. We also do the roadmap document for legal reform on forest and peatland governance. And it has been completed, and that will be the guide for us to do the legal reform, as well as law enforcement uh, that is related to the forest and the land. We have also completed the first stage of the licensing information system, which is basically looking into the map of Indonesia, there are too many overlaps. One piece of land may have three or four licenses on top of it. And if you are talking about three or four licenses on top of it, that is not yet talking about the rights of the people there that was there even in the beginning. So the first license may already violate that rights. So the second license is a second violation. The third license is a third violation, and that creates conflict. So the first thing, part of the conflict management, we need to have the licensing information system that is done. This is a national 
movement that the Red Plus Agency is pushing and it's now under the control of the, <coughs> the BIG, the, the National Mapping uh, Agency, the National Mapping Spatial, Agent, Spatial Mapping Agency, BIG. With that, we will be able to now get everybody put their license uh, information, both from the private sector as well as the government entities so that we will be able to uh, do control, manage that better moving forward. You can imagine now that if I say that, in the past, that is not there. In the past, it's chaotic. In the past, it was like a wild west on the forest. We also do a license audit, and we try that in the three uh, locations, Kalimantan, Central Kalimantan, Jambi, and East Kalimantan, and the result so far has shown us something like that. Licensing documents are not well documented. And number two, you see the statistic there, okay? License issuance do not conform with laws and regulations. License holders do not fulfill their obligation. Like post issuance of the license, you have the, or the plantation permit and others, you need to do this, 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 and that was not being done. So the community is always first and foremost in our consideration. In 2011, with RRI, we have this conference in Lombok, and uh, we make a very strong declaration that the uh, right and protection of the adult communities, the custom-based community, needs to be put on a high priority of the government. Never done before. And now, the Constitutional Court of Indonesia look into this matter and say, yes, this is in our constitution. You have to protect that, and you have to acknowledge that. And then the declaration or the decision of the Constitutional Court number 35 is out last year. And this is now the principles that we are pushing and we are on track in making that stand. Also committed to have robust conflict resolution mechanism. National Park is one area that we start from. Okay, there are five national parks that we are concentrating our effort into that. Okay, besides earlier I mentioned about the forest fire. We also support law enforcement efforts to protect our forest and peatland. Again, never before we have this kind of situation done in Indonesia, whereby in Central Kalimantan, for instance, five cases had been decided by district court. One of the case verdict, the director is convicted and penalized for two years imprisonment and damages of one billion rupiah. I mean, before when you get illegal logging operation, you catch the one with the chainsaw and you treat that and you put that into the jail for six months and that's it. But who instruct them has never been unearthed. And then what happened is that when you do that, what we are now doing is basically having the corporate crime being applied and more than one regulations applied for those uh, committing uh, forest crime. So a lot of cases is now being trailed, trialed, tried, and then this is the situation now. We are working hard to prevent and mitigate forest and pit fires and to ensure that Red Plus does not alienate the source of livelihood for communities and more enhancing rather than alienating. And I don't like to use these negative terms. I like to use the positive term. The Red Plus should enhance the source of livelihood of communities. Okay, we are doing that on the green village approach. And to ensure that education on Red Plus should start at as early as possible, there are 144 green schools that we have established in Kalimantan, uh, as well as now moving into Jambi as well. I will skip this one because this is what I'm doing now to get our message or strategy operation out, to get your response, to enrich our strategy further. And we are committed to engage a wider range of stakeholders. Again, that's what I'm trying to do now. But we are also doing that at national level, at sub-national level, and sub-sub-national level, as well as to other communities as well. And for that matter, in terms of funding, we have created the design and also the almost ready for implementation, the Trust Fund for Red Plus in Indonesia, so that we are not relying only on the channel that is the government budget, but we are creating a 
other stream besides that that can complement that to response to the speed as well as to the thoroughness of what is needed. In doing that, ladies and gentlemen, we need to do safeguards. We are making use of the, the local wisdom in terms of creating the safeguards. And one principle that we are following is that when you're talking about safeguard, don't talk about disturbed neighbor concept. You're talking about the community as a partner. Definitely when you say that, it's easy to say, it sounds heroic, but in terms of making it happen, it was maybe triple or quadruple in terms of difficulties. Because you need to make sure that the community that will become your partner understand what is their rights and what is their role. And that is another uh, process. We call our safeguard precise. And we are committed to ensure the public benefit of Red Plus implementation. Also that we are committed to uphold our integrity and being transparent and accountable. I changed that letter on top by just one word, trust. Because at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, this game is not, if you can call it a game, this endeavor, okay, is, will not take off at any rate if there is no trust. And to be able to gain trust, we need to ensure that what we are doing is not only professional, accountable as well, and also transparent so that we can make use of all the resources, all the capacity, all the knowledge, all the skills, all the experiences that is there in the air that we can combine again because what our situation is, what our challenge is, is a global problem that requires global solution. And any solution on the ground should contribute. And to be able to contribute, it has to be using understandable language. And understandable language is the core of trust. Thank you very much. Thanks for a moment. So, stay with me. I'd, I'd like to, to thank uh, Bupak uh, Pakheru for his words, for his speech, and also for coming so far uh, to talk with us. Um, I use that word bupak intentionally. That means father in Indonesian, and it's an honorific. Uh, if you hear people calling each other Pakheru, uh, Pakwili, uh, that's, uh, that's the honorific. And I, I bring that up specifically to uh, contrast that with the analogy that we used between child, adolescent, and adult. And, and I think the words, the presentation, the work uh, that Paheru and his team have put forward uh, exhibit maturity beyond the humbleness that you are you are stating as as an adolescent. This is not just an adolescent endeavor. This is quite a mature endeavor, uh, and in that sense, that honorific, that father represents, I think, a more accurate representation of where we stand in relation to each other. We are, we are talking as partners with you, uh, and, and I hope that that is the tone that we all bring to this conversation in red. But thank you again. Thank you so much for your words. I'd like to welcome all the speakers to come up uh, to the dais and have a seat, please. Uh, you, have a, you have a seat here to join us as well. Um, we are going to uh, have a panel discussion. We're going to hear a few words from, from a few folks uh, here uh, with us today. I'm going to have a seat and transition to the other mic as well. So, wonderful. Thank you. <clears throat> so with us today, we have, uh, you have met Francis and you have met His Ex Excellency Paheru. Uh, we also have with us today Mina Setra, who is the Deputy Secretary General of the Adat community organization, Aman, which is the Indigenous Peoples Alliance of the Archipelago. Uh, and she is traveling with this delegation uh, for important reasons and is going to talk uh, to us a little bit now about those reasons, about the role uh, of RED in the goals and objectives of the Adat communities uh, and of their objectives for their own forests and their communities. So please welcome Mina Setra, and, and we look forward to your comments, Mina. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be here uh, and have this opportunity to speak uh, together with all these high-level <laughs> uh, people, Pak Heru and Luke Francis. Um, Pak Heru 
make it hard for me to say anything because it's like he's already Sorry. saying anything <laughs> that I want to say about indigenous peoples. Uh, it's already there in his presentation as well. But I would like to start with the the title of the discussion today, saying, "Can save, can red save Indonesian forests?" Well, in the perspective of indigenous peoples, we would like to say it. Can red save the people who save the forest? That's uh, two different ways of, of seeing uh, the situation and also the, the target, the aim of uh, having red in Indonesia. So for us indigenous peoples, um, you may already, maybe you heard about uh, the motto that we always saying, no rights, no red. So in that context, uh, we start engaging with all red issues to make sure how to save the people who save the forest. As you know that indigenous peoples uh, depend their life to forest, they have their livelihood uh, in the forest and really much depend on the forest. And they are also has been proven as the guardian of the forest for years. So to save them so they can be able to continue saving the forest is the target it's the aim of, of us uh, involved in all these uh, red processes. I, I just want to introduce Aman a little bit. Um, Indigenous Peoples Alliance of the Archipelago, or Aman, is an umbrella organization of indigenous peoples in Indonesia. We have 2,250 uh, community, community members and about 15 million people in populations. <coughs> Um, we have we work through uh, 20 regional chapters and 97 uh, local chapters like this district level um, Most of our members are indigenous peoples who live in the forest areas So it's really important for us talking about uh, uh, forest issues um, The the new update uh, situation now we have in Indonesia regarding to uh, forest issues is that actually we are working now with, together with uh, National Commission on Human Rights to have a national inquiry on cases, conflict cases in forest areas. It started already the process now and in the next uh, two, three months, we will have a, a general hearing about the, the, the cases. We have 48 uh, conflict cases that will be uh, bring, bringing up. The aim to have this national inquiry is to, ha to, to create a formula, a national formula on how to solve the conflict in Indonesia relate, related to forest. Why forest? Because that is the, 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 the issue that we are all in now. And also uh, because last year the national, uh, the constitutional court ruling uh, came out with very strong um, decision that customary forest is not state forest. So that is a really strong uh, claim uh, and it's uh, approved by the constitutional court. And for us, it really, really matters. It can save more than 40 million <coughs> hectares of forest according to our, uh, how do you say, hitungan? Calculations. Okay, calculations. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> so um, to be able to really involve in these uh, processes, so we, uh, Indigenous Peoples Alliance, and also our partners, we've been doing a lot of mapping process in Indonesia. This year, uh, end of this year, we will finish 7 million hectares um, uh, mapping of the uh, indigenous territories. And we have hand over some part of it that already been verified and through all the uh, <coughs> process in the community and also, you know, before we before we um, show our map, we also do a verification process just to make it legitimate. So the community also, uh, we have to also have a permit uh, permissions from the community before we show it. So we deliver about 2.4. Million hectares to UKP4 to the BIG, so it can included in the one map policy, and also we uh, hand over same uh, part of it to Ministry of Environment. 
why Ministry of Environment? Because Ministry of Environment actually had this uh, very strong law, number 32, 2009, about uh, environmental protections um, and management. And it says in this law that uh, it's uh, indigenous peoples have the rights on management the forest uh, using the traditional knowledge. So we've been working with the Ministry of Environment to develop a mechanism on how to identify indigenous communities and their, their traditional knowledge on how to manage the forest. So we've been working with different um, governments, uh, agencies. agencies and ministries uh, about how to, to, to move forward with all these um, ideas, the issue, the aim of how, how to save this forest. We have MOU with the Ministry of Environment. We also have MOU with um, national land agencies. To actually, we develop an ideas with national land agencies on how to register indigenous territories, uh, collective uh, ownership of the territory. It's never happened before. It's still ongoing. It's it's not easy. Maybe like Pak Heru says, the the river have sark or the sea have sarks. <laughs> <laughs> There's challenges, but we um, we optimist that it will go uh, somewhere. It will go one day uh, to have this sort of recognition. It never it's never happened before that we have a recognition on collective rights, ownership on territories, yeah, and that is the idea for the future. And hopefully, the new governments will will continue that uh, ideas. So um, we have several things going on now. We have um, draft on indigenous people's rights law uh, being discussed now in the parliament. Um, we are hoping that it will come out this year, uh, end of the the, uh, the, the governments. Um, but we are still dealing with the the uh, the content of the the law, but it's really uh, promising that we will have this uh, this law uh, this year, hopefully. And we also um, been working with uh, local governments. Uh, we work with the local government in East Kalimantan with the Malinau uh, governments to develop a local uh, regulations on indigenous people's rights. So we actually we try to to assist government uh, as best as we can to, to be partner with them, to, to, to say that uh, this is what you, what you can do and this is what you cannot do. So because it's, mm. for us, RAT provide us a way to, to be seen. We were like, there's no indigenous peoples before in Indonesia, <laughs> but in one, one day, one night, also, especially with the constitutional court ruling, it's like magic. And the day after, we are already suddenly exist. Mm -hmm. And all these maps is a very strong evidence. We need evidence. Uh, we have um, questions from governments, from uh, private sectors. Where are you? You said there is indigenous people. You have customary forests. You have territories. Where are they? So. With doing all this mapping process to 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 provide evidence that we are exist, and um, we keep continue uh, doing this mapping, and we are uh, gl really glad that the UKP uh, uh, UKP four. I always remember US UKP four. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Red Agency um, also willing to continue uh, working to help us to uh, have more mapping, and also how to recognize. Uh, those map, so it's really um, the, the situation that we really uh, have the progress in Indonesia actually regarding all these uh, forest issues. But it's not the only things that are happening. I mean, there's a lot of progress uh, in national level, also in international level uh, about forest issues, red issues that bringing some changes in our pol uh, local policies and national policies. But there's also challenges that uh, we have to face. Uh, we still have uh, things going on on the ground, on the field level, in the community level. Conflicts still happen. 
um, people still get uh, arrested because protecting their territories. Uh, forest fires still happen. So there's still many challenges on the ground. And I believe like UKP4, uh, Badan Red, uh, Red Agency is working hard. Uh, everyone in Indonesia is working hard to change the situations. Um, the, 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 in the discussion uh, yesterday morning, I was, I came up with this um, question that actually for indigenous peoples in, in the, the communities, they're just asking one question. There's a lot of progress already happening, but why it doesn't really change this situation on the ground? They don't really feel it yet. So the, the challenge for us, everybody now that have concern on forest issues, on communities issues, is how to make it real for them. We are working here in international level, in national level, dealing with papers. We come with very good research, come with all these maps and things. But does it matter for people in the community? Uh, I, I um, encourage you to come to the community to see it yourself. <laughs> um, because you know it's really important to go down there to to make you really feel it so you can really um, make what you're fighting for is really worth worth it uh, i think the big the biggest challenge for indonesia is how to change the behavior uh, that's already been uh, from national until the local yeah? it's already there um, to change it to a new, um, new behavior, Pattern. new things. Yeah. It's not really easy. And we, we realize that it cannot be done only like one year, two years. Um, so, but we have to take all it takes to start doing it. And it's, it's good that we have many good people who are willing to do so. So we encourage you. Uh, everybody to also join us, join the forces <laughs> to save Indonesian forests uh, because it will contribute to save uh, all part of the world. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for those remarks. Thank you for your presence, for your words, uh, for for uh, doing your best to represent a community that. Uh, is more being seen, uh, and we hope that that uh, vision will help us save the, the, the people that will help us save the forests. So thank you. I'm going to turn it over to Frances Seymour now uh, to add her comments. Um, Frances has been a keen observer from her <coughs> um, position at C4 of the forests in Indonesia, of the Indonesian government, as well as how Indonesia fits into the global pattern of forest management, forest protection, uh, C4 is not just an Indonesian uh, think tank, it is a global forest think tank. So Francis brings a perspective that I think will be very useful and I look forward to your remarks as well. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to report, sitting here beside Mina, she did that without any notes. <coughs> it's quite extraordinary. Um, so let me start by saying that uh, I've been working on my carbon footprint and um, earlier this month I was in Brazil. Uh, with a small team from CGD, and we were going around interviewing various people about the Brazilian experience in reducing deforestation and all of the challenges you know, that they're encountering trying to, to maintain the success that has been achieved. And one of the guys that we were talking to sort of paused in the conversation and looked me in the eye and he goes, you know, Brazil is not for amateurs. And <laughs> I sort of feel like Indonesia is not for amateurs either. And I'm the amateur on this panel, you know, looking to my, my right over here. So being uh, brave or foolish, I will nevertheless uh, weigh in. I want to just make three quick points. Um, one is to look back and remind all of us just how revolutionary this whole enterprise is. Um, second is to talk about where we are now and remind us about just how tough what we're trying to do is. And then look ahead and identify some as a set of threats and opportunities on the, on the very near horizon. So first of all, looking back, 
one of the few good things about aging is that you get perspective. <laughs> and uh, as, as Michael mentioned, you know, I have been a participant observer in the Indonesian forestry sector for about 25 years now or so. And so can, can really assure you um, how the kinds of changes that Mina was just describing. I mean, the very idea of recognizing indigenous people's rights over forests. I mean, it just, you couldn't even talk about it mm -hmm. even 10 years ago, much less do something about it. So, so it's a big change. We should have a birthday cake up here on the, on the stage because it, it's just this week that was the four year anniversary of the letter of intent between Indonesia and Norway. At the anniversary was on Monday, I think. And I think as that and, you know, as, as the years go by, we maybe start to forget just how important and ground shifting a moment that, you know, set of commitments really was. Um, and we really, we shouldn't underestimate the significance of that turning point um, in the broader political economy of the management of Indonesia's forests. Now, I was in Indonesia with the Ford Foundation 25 years ago at the time that the international community first discovered Indonesia's forests and indigenous peoples and biodiversity and everything, and all the donors began to pile in. And I think it's fair to say that several billion dollars were spent in various forms of, of cooperation in trying to save Indonesia's forests and, and the people that, that depend on them. And I don't want to say that all that money was wasted. A lot of good things were done. A lot of capacity was built. A lot of nice maps were drawn. But the truth is, none of it fundamentally shifted the political economy of, of Indonesia's forest management in terms of who controlled it, um, who had rights to it, where the revenues went, how those revenues were managed, you know, all that kind of thing. Whereas this letter of intent with the, the Norwegian government, I think, really did constitute that kind of, of shift. First of all, it raised the level of attention to forest issues to the level, level of the head of state and the cabinet, you know, talking about it, you know, at that level. Um, it created a new pole of influence in the office of the president, which really challenged the monopoly that, frankly, the Ministry of Forestry, by and large, and, and quite a number of, of agribusiness interests had on the control of, of what happened to that vast area of real estate that is Indonesia's designated forest. Um, then quickly followed some significant policy initiatives, you know, the establishment of the, the moratorium, um, the, the one map process and the, the many things that, that Heru told us about, um, which again, you know, quite revolutionary. I mean, part of this uh, donor attention to Indonesia for the previous, you know, 20 years had been trying to get the Ministry of Forestry to disclose maps of where the forests were and what was happening to them. Well, it was only through the indicative moratorium map that that data first came into the public domain. So transparency, big step forward. And then I think in addition to the policy initiatives that came directly out of the, the letter of intent agreement, it, it changed the conversation and the discourse more generally in Indonesia and created space for things to go ahead that aren't directly, they weren't directly in the letter of intent, but I think it's plausible to say might not have happened as fully or quickly um, without this new context. And I think that includes the constitutional court decision. I think that includes the new attention to forest-related law enforcement and this increased level of prosecutions um, that Pat Heru uh, mentioned, the attention of the Corruption Eradication Commission um, to these, these issues. All, I think, are, are, are appropriately, um, at least with a dotted line, you know, mm. some attribution to this change that took place um, only four years ago. So, uh, bottom line, this is revolutionary. Moving on to current challenges. Um, I'm going to label the elephant in the room, and that is, despite all of this attention and activity, deforestation rate is still high, maybe even going up. And the kinds of problems that communities ex experience on the ground, as Mina has just told us, continue to happen. I mean, we did a field trip on my, my recent visit. We got, you know, communities still being brutalized for standing up to uh, corporate interests that are taking down their forests. So, you know, has this translated into change on the ground? Not yet, <coughs> uh, to our satisfaction. But why is that? Well, you know, as, as Mina said, these are things that take, you know, years to, to express themselves. And we're moving now from these you know, significant policy level commitments to actually implementing them, you know, in, in meaningful ways across the bureaucracy. And like I said earlier, it's good that Pajero has a management background because this is like the management problem from hell. I mean, you've got to, you know, coordinate across sectoral ministries who still retain, you know, their, their authorities um, and perhaps interests that are not always completely aligned with the commitments that have been made. 
Uh, what more? The need to align vertically with different, you know, the provincial, the district, and now even the village level that retain, you know, mm. various levels of authority and, and align incentives for that. Um, that's that's going to take time. And that's not all. This whole environment is a moving target. I mean, even since Pajero drew that slide, we have a new province, you know, new province yeah. of North Kalimantan. So we've got, you know, changes in jurisdictions. We've got a new village law that could change the balance of power among those vert vertical levels. I'm told there's a prospective law on peatlands that could, you know, yeah. change where the go, no-go lines are. Uh, Mina mentioned to this new law on indigenous peoples that's in prospect. So, you know, there's a lot of things going on that we, we got to stay on top of to make sure that they're aligned with objectives rather than, than taking this off in another way. So, again, bottom line, this is a really tough job, and I'm glad we've got uh, some, some real pros on it. So briefly, looking ahead, um, nobody has said the E word. We have elections coming up in Indonesia on uh, July 9th. It's I was like going to ask soon. if everyone ignored it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's a real risk of this being a disruptive change. I mean, when your agency is established by and the head is appointed by the president, when you have a change in president, you know, uh, it, it could go, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a risk. Um, and yet, on the other hand, the momentum of a new administration coming into office, which would happen in October, is a new moment for new commitments and bold statements. And you know, so it could be a positive thing. And I think we all need to think about what we can do you know, to help uh, increase the chances of that happening. Another, on the one hand, on the other hand, is the forest fires. Uh, Pajero mentioned, you know, that there is this risk and, you know, you start reading the science, could be, you know, conditions are the same for an El Nino year, it could be another big year of fires, and don't let it be said that I was hoping for forest fires, but there could be a silver lining on the haze. If, in fact, the forest fires take place, it will increase national attention and international attention to what's going on in Indonesia's forests, and that could provide a moment for a new administration to come in and say, we're going to, you know, do something about this, and so we need to be, be ready for that. And then finally, a, a sort of risk opportunity um, situation is all our communications about this, both domestically and, and internationally. You know, it, it would be very easy for attention of people like me to um, come be understood the, the wrong way and prick nationalist sentiments. It's like, well, who are you to tell us what to do with our forests? And I think in election years, that sensitivity is, is uh, at a cyclical high. Um, and, of course, even though somebody said, oh, yes, everybody's behind this agenda, well, actually, everybody isn't. I mean, there are still some business-as-usual interests who are resisting this in various ways. And, yeah. you know, at the times of, like, announcing the moratorium, they come out of the closet and say, actually, this is not what we want. And so we, we need to be careful. On the other hand, there are constituencies, both active and latent, who share this agenda. Many of you know that a lot of uh, actors in commodity supply chains, particularly the consumer-facing companies like the Unilevers and the Nestle's, and, um, have made commitments to deforestation-free supply chains. And a few of the producer countries have aligned themselves with that agenda as well, and, and some pretty big traders. Getting them to be part of this song sheet, I think, is a real potential powerful set of alliances. Indigenous peoples, um, I love the way Mina said, you know, that the red has made us visible. So to the extent that communities who have felt that they could be harmed by the red agenda, seeing how it can help, a very uh, powerful message. Um, let me just close by saying, in my view, how the international community can help on this uh, challenging agenda. Um, first of all, we need to admit that we're the amateurs um, and not you know, domestically, politically legitimate uh, actors. We're not going to be voting uh, you know, on, mm -hmm. on July 9th, and so can't really have opinions on that. So I think our job is to first um, recognize what's being attempted and express confidence that it can be achieved. Second of all is uh, in follow the Norwegian example and saying yes, it matters for the world and we're willing to put money behind it uh, on a performance basis if possible. And then frankly, get out of the way and leave it to the professionals to figure out how to get it done and uh, be confident that they're gonna do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Francis. Uh, I, I think those were as insightful of comments as I expected, so we appreciate it. I have many, many questions for each of you, um, but we have only 35 minutes left for the day. So rather than take the time for my own burning curiosity, I would love to turn to the audience uh, to hear questions from you. We have a microphone. We are being webcast live, so if you could uh, wait to ask your question until you have the microphone, please go ahead and right up front. Hold on one second for the microphone.
Uh, good morning to everyone. First and foremost, I wish to express my profound thanks and appreciation to Center for Global Development. I'm a student here from Sierra Leone, West Africa, studying network and computer engineering at DeVry University in Lanterville, Virginia. And I wish to thank the organizers. This question is, <coughs> is for His Excellency and Mina. As the last speaker said, let's assume that the new government coming in has been blessed. Here, this is the geographical location where you have tens of thousands of Indonesians they are staying since their great great grandfathers. But as the new government comes in, their geological department discovers bauxite and I all in this geographical location. And this mineral is going to help to beef up the GDP of Indonesia. You, as the head of that organization, what are you going to do? Thank you for that question. Paheru. Uh, can as you a, collect the questions? Please? Yes, uh, we can collect a few questions, absolutely. Please, uh, Mr. Strand. I don't quite hear what the first question or the first question. Uh, good morning, and uh, my name is Jim Tarrant from Angility IRG. Uh, excellent presentations this morning. Uh, my question is a little bit provocative. Uh, given the new red agency, uh, the decentralization to the Kabupaten provincial levels in, in Indonesia, and the work, the longstanding and ongoing work of many NGOs, including Aman. Um, is there really a need for the Ministry of Forestry as presently constructed, or should we do away with the ministry and come <laughs> up with a, a set of new agencies that are more uh, proactive and constructive than the ministry has been? Thank you. I'm uh, John Strand from the World Bank's Research Department. I also happen to be from Norway, so I uh, have an interest in these issues, I've been following them carefully. Um, I have a, a few um, issues here, uh, because I think your presentation was a little bit, in a sense, uh, two-sided, because you started with this issue that you have the concessions which potentially could eat up almost all the forest. And then you have the red program. But I didn't see the connections between the two, right? How How do you... How do you prevent these concessions from actually materialize? Uh, mm. Do you have do you have means of actually doing that? Uh, okay. do, do you have do you have legal means of doing it, or do you have financial means of doing it? We know that mm. the forest sector in 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 Indonesia. I don't know how it is now, but it has been very large, and there's also pressure from businesses. There's a high capacity in the sawmill industry, which put pressure on 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 on. Uh, uh, utilization and there's the local governments which have typically had much of a hand on the development so my, my question is more what's the, what's the actual impact from above here on the deforestation rate and you, you I saw a projection for deforestation which seemed to go down but it wasn't going down very quickly uh, it was going down from 1 billion tons to maybe 0 0.9, 0 0.85 uh, over a, uh, like a six year period, which it may, it's a good development, but That's good enough. many people would say maybe it's not sufficient. So uh, but these are very broad and difficult questions I know, but, but they're sort of at the heart of the issue here. Thank you. So I, I, I think let's stop at, with three yeah. questions. And I actually, there was a common strand between those three questions. And, uh, and I think the connection that I make between those is we have a Ministry of Forestry that's handing out concessions uh, along with other ministries that are covering the land. We have a question about how Red Plus and the financial incentives of Red Plus will get to people and decision makers on the ground. And then we have a question about economic incentives, which was quite similar, although you know, I think uh, the, the question from The Economist, not surprisingly, was, how do we connect these dots between the current owners of something of value, concessions, and uh, the government and its objectives in red and the, the money? So there is a very common theme. I'd wonder, uh, Paheru, if you'd like to address those, those questions of connecting that dot. Thank you, Micah. Well, 
yesterday we had breakfast and we got a lot of difficult questions and I think today I got even more difficult questions. <coughs> I think I have to leave to Washington very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> the 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 <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. That was uh, really. Uh, I will. I will start with that uh, notion that how do you connect the concession that you need to protect not to cut the trees, with the Red Plus agency and the, the Red Plus a agenda. Uh, basically. Because those concessions already held by these companies with this organization, and a promise of a very high economic reward is in that concession. So the question that we will be asking perhaps is: Is Red Plus an equally or sufficiently uh, strong counter incentive to the cutting of the trees? And I will say, in the way that it was pre proposed. In the beginning of the UNFCCC discussion, I will say that it will, it will never be able to compete short term. Because whatever the payment that is uh, considered to be in line with the new commodity that's called carbon will be much, much smaller than what can be promised by oil, by gas, by timber, by palm oil, and by pulp and paper. Definitely not competitive. So the discussion needs to be shifted from purely economic terms into something that is more sustainable for the planet. And, and that is something that may be a moral question, but not only a moral question, but also the reality question for longevity of our state of uh, being the relationship between the humankind and the planet itself. A lot of activities is being done in terms of defining what is the GDP for the poor, what is the value of the national natural asset, how is it being violated by the small profit that corporations have compared to the sacrifice that the planet uh, uh, actually giving. So those kind of discussion will be part of the dialogue in terms of doing this reduction of the violation of the forest with the argument of the Red Plus. And that's exactly why we are not talking about Red Plus on carbon terms only, and not only talking about forest being forest as part of the land itself. We need to know the land in its all functions and the forest in its own different function. And the two functions need to be combined. So that is the argument in terms of that line. Uh, What's the other one? I think that's actually that, yeah, that's that covers very well. Yeah, I, I'd I'd like to to ask others if you have a comment on that. Otherwise, uh, take some more questions. Well, I think maybe briefly to John Strand's point, um, one of Paheru's slides showing the uh, small percentage of active concessions that have all of their permits lined up um, suggests a tool for addressing. Um, some of the already licensed area when in fact those licenses may not have legal integrity as and as he mentioned not just in terms of the the permitting process itself but in terms of underlying land rights that might not have been uh, adjudicated yet and mina mentioned like this national human rights commission you know inquiry on land conflict so i think there are a number of entry points where one could contest whether you know a license in place you know is in fact you know uh untouchable to con you know continue deforestation Thank you. And, and I actually want to amplify one of Pat Harris' points, I'll come right back to you, is, is that um, what I heard there, and I hope the, the audience heard very clearly, was that Red Plus is not a mechanism to compensate for lost opportunity cost of current use. And I think that's actually um, a little controversial in some ways, mm -hmm. uh, potentially. I think it's an important message, and it's a different mindset. Um, and it means that Red Plus will work and operate a different way. Uh, and the other thing I heard in there is, or maybe I would like to have heard in there, or at least I'll project into there, um, is that while we may be measuring in terms of carbon and compensating in terms of carbon in a red plus mechanism, this is not just about carbon, and therefore we should not be thinking about this as a swap, that we are buying just a carbon service, surface, uh, service from Indonesia. We're actually doing much more than that. Yeah. Mina, would you have something to add to that? Yeah, I want to respond on the questions about the Minister of Forest. Minister of Forest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which we all avoided like quite uh, <laughs> qu quite delicately. Good. I like that question. And since I am not government, 
<laughs> not also C4, so I can freely say what I want to say about the <laughs> Ministry of Forestry. So actually, we have a proposal. Uh, maybe, hopefully, the new governments will take it serious. Um, we want Ministry of Forestry to be shut down. <laughs> well, it's not in only that, but we, our proposal is actually to have an, another, uh, a new uh, ministry, something like Ministry of Agrarian and Natural Resources. So all this uh, uh, sectoral, like ministry, uh, forestry, uh, will be under this ministries as Directorate General, something. Um, and it's only have the authority on the function of the forest. It doesn't have any authority on the tenure issues, tenure rights issues. So it don't, it won't have uh, authority to uh, give license because <coughs> that is actually the the, the biggest problems the we corrupting. have now. Yeah. yeah the so that's uh, that's the idea actually. We still um, working on that idea and see the possibilities. Have, hopefully, uh, we get many support for that idea. Wonderful. Let's take another round of questions. Uh, Doug Boucher up, up in the front here. Uh, your microphone's coming to you. And then uh, we'll do uh, the gentleman from the Forest Service. Uh, and then Andres here in the front. Yes. Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation, Buck Hero. Um, I'd like to invite you to confront the E word that, uh, that uh, uh, Francis brought up. Because if you look at, at the progress that that has been mm -hmm. made with uh, forests in Indonesia. Many of the most important steps, the Red Plus Agreement in Bali, the moratorium, the letter of intent, the positive response to the Constitutional Court decision, the establishment of the Red Plus Agency, and the appointment of you as, as the head of it, were presidential decisions, really presidential leadership. So what is the post-SBY situation going to be? Indonesian forests. <laughs> okay. Uh, we had yes, a gentleman yes. here from the Forest Service in the blue shirt. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Kent Elliott, and I'm from the U.S. Forest Service. And my question is for uh, His Excellency Bapak Keru. Um, during the presentation, you mentioned the development of the MRV institution. And I was hoping that you could speak a little bit more about the status of that development and how that institution would interact with the line ministries and technical agencies that would be relevant for the measurement, reporting, and verification of emission reductions. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Andres? Uh... Thank you. Andres Dahl-Jorgensen from Climate Advisors. Pakiheru, uh, this is uh, an excellent presentation. I just wanted to... Uh, first, if I, uh, if you allow me to just highlight a few of the things that actually Francis also touched upon. She mentioned Brazil at the beginning, and if you look back at what Brazil achieved from 2004 onwards, um, I, th I see a parallel here to what where we are in 2014 in Indonesia. All the issues that you point to presidential leadership, s essentially exposing the mess, uh, is what you have done so far in this project, and then now it's getting into implementation mode, how to deal with that mess. 150% of central Kalimantan under some kind of concession, or if you count the overlapping concessions, if I heard uh, a previous presentation you made, that is pretty revolutionary. Um, the ind indigenous rights, the fundamental land use reform, moratorium, the one map, this is really going into the heart of the political economy. Uh, and this is a sort of much broader project, as you say, it's a development project, it's part of Indonesia's sort of dem democracy project. Um, the rule of law uh, and, and uh, the work you're doing with, with local governments. My question, I think, or, or the fundamental underlining of everything you do is about transparency and about participation. Um, Francis asked a very good question that I would like you to maybe reflect on is, uh, uh, is how the international community can help. This is about shifting uh, the balance of power uh, domestically. Uh, and there's limits to what foreigners can do, but what, what is it that the international community can do to help? And also maybe a uh, reflection uh, domestically, what has changed in the balance of power? How have different, uh, different actors been empowered? And, and how has that been a, a, sort of con uh, uh, a very um, part of your strategy from the beginning? 
how do you see the private sector having moved from being opposing the project to now part of it at least being in favor? Uh, are there movements within the, some of the line ministries that now see this as the way forward? Can you, can you give us a, a, a little uh, reflection on how that dynamic is working domestically in Indonesia, despite, the, of course, the challenging political economy we're talking about? Just a, another easy question. <laughs> so uh, I, I would like to do the uh, come back to the MRV t uh, slightly more technical question and start with, I think, that E, which is both an elephant in the room and an election. Uh, we evidently have two elephants. Um, and, uh, two elephants. <laughs> I, I will use an imagery, uh, an image that we, we talked about yesterday. Um, and, and this was in relation to the Red Agency. We talked about it as a sapling, a young tree itself. Uh, and we talked a little bit about how planting that tree was political leadership. Getting that, getting that tree in the ground was political leadership. Um, I would like to hear a little bit in answer to, to Doug's question and in part to Andres's question. Um, what are the deeper roots? How, how deep do those roots go? And how do uh, both you and we make sure that, that we, to mix metaphors, uh, provide mm -hmm. the right shark spray so that that sapling <laughs> does not get pulled out of the ground? I know, sorry, Michelle's groaning in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, uh, Ken and Andreas. True, we know that this agency is only, what, by time of October, this agency is only 10 months old. It was actually getting a lot of expectations raising since uh, four years, as uh, Francis mentioned, the LOI. And uh, that is under the leadership of an outgoing president. So an uh, incoming president will have a different agenda, may have some agenda to prove himself or herself, himself, I think two only, candidate, only <laughs> male candidates now. Uh, but then the agenda that we, the going out president has brought up, has caught up in the international world, but as well as what our effort is to bring it down to the ground. So we, I, I, I like to liken this. This is a sapling that is growing, but we are trying our best to create a force field that is protecting that by making sure that the argument that we are building is supported by the international world, but as well as the subnational organization, subnational government and people. Five provinces, 29 districts is not the whole Indonesia, but they are having different leadership in terms of the political party backing them, which means that this is not something that we just do it without the logic of that. So that when it comes to the power in the parliament and the cabinet later on, we need to have those seed planted in the right people that may actually be a force to contend in the, in the future. That, that's one. But that is political. The other side of it is really the technical and the work. And when you're talking about the customary people, like what uh, Mirna Mina said about the indigenous people, they are not political in that sense. But they are political in a stronger sense. This is the voice of the people when it's already get, getting the license by the court, constitutional court to, for their existence, for their voice, for their rights, this is a power that we will have the roots on. Not because for political reason we need their protection and their support, because that is morally right, and that is what we are in, believing in. So the activities that we are doing, okay, moving from the ground and moving up, is actually not something that is done uh, without consideration of the E-word, okay? We understand that election is there. We understand who is going to be moving up. We understand what is their agenda, the ninth agenda of presidential candidate A and the eighth agenda of presidential candidate B is in our study. So we are studying it deeply and try to understand and influence how will that put, in, uh, put us into the position that necessity is there. I believe that in the first one year of the new presidency, this is not going to be the highest of any priorities. So we take that. So manage our expectation, 
that if we have this corridor to maintain the strength and the, the what you call it, the, the strength of our movement, momentum. momentum, moving forward, then that will be good. But if that is not coming from the national government, we want that to come from the sub-national government and the international world. So if we get this from the bottom and from the top, a strong movement, the momentum is continuing on that, then I believe that any good president is going to be uh, following what needs to be good for, for, for the planet and for the people. That's why if we are only talking about emissions, that will be even further from an, any agenda of the agenda of any president that is concerned about their people, concerned about development. Okay, so we have to put that, not for, again, not only for political reason, because that is what we believe as the ideology of Red Plus in Indonesia at this time. So uh, I will not be able to say which one of the two candidates is going to be the president and how to align with them uh, and uh, each other, but we are talking about what will be the fundamental that the two president cannot run away from. And that is where we are trying to make it strong. Thank you very much. Um, let's turn to the MRV question, the, and specifically from Kent. Uh, the question was really how the, the um, institution of the Red Plus Agency uh, will be interacting mm -hmm. with aligned ministries on, on uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification, the mapping. And, and I'm happy to turn to you, but I'd also love to, to take this opportunity to introduce uh, Dr. William Sabandar, who is going to be uh, the, one of the, the leads under Paheru running the agency, the COO of that, uh, that group. And if uh, up to you, of course, but I would welcome either of you to, to address that technical MRV question and interacting with the line ministries. Okay, I'll let uh, Dr. Sabandar to, to okay. do, and maybe I can add a little bit in the, uh, the dotting the I and crossing the T. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I'll try to, to address uh, technically. I think the main challenge on developing the, uh, the MRV system is actually with the accountability and, and transparent uh, process of, of, of the, how the institution is set. Because uh, we put that we are going to develop uh, international, credible, uh, transparent institution on, on MRV. And it's not easy because, like, uh, Francis say the main challenge is when you come to measuring the deforestation level in Indonesia, you come with uh, several different different numbers. And when you come, when 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 Ministry of Forestry, Ministry of Environment, yeah, name it, uh, come with different numbers, and uh, the world won't trust it. So one of the things that we need to solve is actually with the One Map Initiative is actually to define to bring together those institutions to come into the, the understanding on this is the way we measure deforestation. And that is something that uh, we work it out now. So we, we bring together the Ministry of Forestry, Minister of Environment, yeah, uh, the uh, uh, Minister of Agriculture to come together with the support of the geospatial uh, agency, and then to, to coordinate on how we we bring. We, we got support from the, the INCAS, uh, the national the national uh, carbon accounting uh, system, whether with the support of the donor, and then try to yeah the Red Plus agency is trying to facilitate those those kind of things to come into to the understanding of reference emission level. That's at the national level. Now you go to the sub national level because the province have different contexts. You can't. You, when you measure the deforestation level, or when you come to the reference emission level, the Papuans will say we still have uh, a lot of forest. You can you cannot use the historical uh, context to measure our, our our reference emission level, like the way you use for Sumatra or, or for Kalimantan. That's why you need you need to go to the subnational and the subnational you you need to go to the district level to do the consolidations and then use the methodology that you develop at the national level and then go down uh, to this. So, and then encourage them to be as transparent as possible when develop one mechanism at the national level. So when we do the reference emission level at the national level, we are going, we are also doing it at the 11 provinces right now. This 11 provinces actually accounted for about 80% of uh, Indonesian forest. 
So one mechanism at the national level, 11 process that we are now doing it, which will support the, the national mechanism. And next year, we are going to extend it to the, to, the, to the all provinces and hoping by that we can get this. One is the, the uh, integrity in the process. And the second one is uh, the transparency uh, of the process. Saying so, I, th I think this is, this is not easy because I would like to mention as, as well, because this, uh, again, the concession is, is not just the issue of, of central government. And that's why uh, vertical integration is, is really needed because the head of district also issue, issue license. So if you don't control at the sub-national level, you're actually not controlling the country. So my job is actually ensuring that you have this integral, uh, inter integral coordination, the vertical coordination, which you can also get support from the sub-national government. You can make sure that the policy that you create at the national level is actually followed by the head of province, the head of districts. And that can be only done if you, they believe that this is the way of, of change the, the, the way uh, the governance of the country is, uh, is, is governed. Thank you. Thank you. Anything to add? Um, yeah, I think uh, that is it's a good uh, perspective on how we are uh, building our MRV uh, mechanism. We know that the, one of the questions and related to the question whether the Ministry of Forestry needs to continue in, in, on, or what and the answer of Mina. Uh, the function is important to collect the data. Okay, so we say that this is the frame, but who do you collect the data from? Where is it going to be done? Remote sensing is not enough. Remote sensing needs to be supported by ground truthing, right? So the remote sensing, even if you have Indonesia without cloud, very clear in the digital map, okay, very clear, will need to be added with the fact of the ground truthing. And the reason why ground truthing is so important is the surface of the land of Indonesia is very different from one location to another when you have peatland. Your peatland can go as deep as 10 meters and suddenly your carbon content there is maybe 100 times than what is appears on the sky from, from the satellite. So we have to do ground truthing. Definitely we cannot do the ground truthing done by an agency in the center government with 60 people. So you need to get that from any other people. So if the Ministry of Forestry, what we ask the Ministry of Forestry now, already have people on the ground that is doing things, but not coming up with numbers that is reliable, we'll need to make sure that those data that's coming out from them is validatable, and so that is something that we can say the reliability of those data is better. That is one. The second is that we also know that the community themselves already have also what is called the community-based monitoring and information system. So we need to connect with them and also agree with the standard that's being used for doing the management, doing the collection of the data. And so this is basically uh, maybe just less than short of crowdsourcing of the data that is going to be used for our MRV. Okay, so that is in a way using that uh, metaphor of, uh, of the, the youth, okay? The crowdsourcing is something that is now is a now thing, not the day before thing. And when you're talking about adolescent, you're talking about young and child and all those things. I imagine myself, I wish I am a Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> I mean, talking about that kind of young, that kind of youth, that kind of spirit, that kind of innovation. Right? So we try to make use of that in terms of getting the collection for the data for the MRV system for us. Validation will need to be done before verification. And, and that is how I think it will, be, it will be done. So the map is important, but not enough. Getting deep into the pit is another thing that needs to be on a ground truthing basis. And that is a combination that we are making use of, and the source of the data will come from the functions that are already on the ground, but make sure that that function is now telling the truth the whole truth and only the truth. Thank you, Pakero. So I think uh, we have seen from your answers that you are not uh, shying away from controversial topics. Um, <laughs> and I think that actually bodes quite well, because uh, as Francis identified, 
uh, it, this is a massive challenge. It's a naughty problem of solving and, and reducing deforestation in Indonesia. We have time for one more question, and then we're going to have, have a, few, a few comments. I'm going to go to Sergio uh, Feld here, um, and, and go ahead. It's actually for Mina. Um, Bahiru, uh, we'll talk on the side. But uh, I'm curious about your um, reference to a, a traditional knowledge system that you'll develop with, uh, I believe, the assistance of the Ministry of Environment, and how that may actually relate to the boots on the ground and what, what we will need from local communities. What will be the platform that you use for that knowledge? Okay. Uh, thank you, Sergio. Um, actually, uh, what we are having now uh, with Ministry of Forestry is uh, def we develop uh, guidelines to identify the traditional knowledge, and it's it's very it's vary uh, from one another to uh, to another place because uh, it's various. It's so many different kind of traditional knowledge, uh, but they have similarities on managing uh, forests. And also environment. So, what we what we are doing now with the ministry is to develop these guidelines. It's almost done, actually. So that will be uh, one of the um, how the, the tools to implement the the law on the environment. So that's uh, what we have now. And re re related to, I just want to uh, echo Pa Heru. We are also now developing the. Uh, guidelines on uh, community-based monitoring and information system, uh, and that will be also have a re relations with the traditional knowledge. So it will be very interesting, I think, uh, when it's done. It's still ongoing now. Wonderful, thank you. So I'm going to offer each of our speakers a, a moment to uh, sum up some of their the most important thoughts they have, and then I will take my prerogative to do the same. Yes. <laughs> so Francis, please. If you have any, uh, any final thoughts, you're welcome to say no if not. Yeah, I guess I, uh, let me um, echo Andreas's um, reflection on the, the analogies with the experience in Brazil. Because I do think that you know, there are moments when things can really change. And we may have one, you know, uh, again, coming up in the, the near horizon. So it's a, it's a reason to be optimistic. So I'll Thank leave you. That. Nina. Well, I just want to to see um, how all the modalities that we have already can be work on the ground. So we're really looking forward to see things really change in the community level. Thank you. I have final thoughts. Okay. I think we have been talking and uh, building a case that Red Plus is beyond carbon and more than forest. But reality is that Red Plus started being an emission discussion. So if we avoid the discussion of emission and stray too far from that, we lost the momentum. And emission discussion, climate change discussion, is actually the momentum that we need to grab and push our development agenda in the right directions for sustainability. Because I think those are the two very power engine, very powerful engine to make sustainable growth, sustainable development with equity at the forefront. The climate change, emissions, as well as the development agenda that is very inclusive, including everybody that is involved in equity being the agenda at the end. Thank you so much, Pajero. A few thoughts to wrap up before, before we uh, let you all go. Um, first of all, a huge thank you again to the delegation for traveling all this way to join us, for allowing us at Climate Advisors and at CGD to help organize your time and to help make sure that, it, that the travel was worth it. Um, I'll echo Francis's recognition that there is clearly much work to be done in Jakarta and in the provinces and in the districts. And we know that we are pulling you away from that important work for this. And I hope that we can make sure that it was worth your time uh, by doing the important work that we all need to do in response. So, so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to just pull out a few phrases and, and words that I heard 
throughout the discussion today. Um, and and uh, I think Francis summed up hope in a way that I think is a, is a notion that we should take away from us. We are at a pivot point. Um, we are at a moment uh, where I think we have not quite made it into huge, substantial progress in Indonesia, but we are potentially at a pivot point where we could go there. And a lot of forces are pushing in that direction. And it's nice to see friends and colleagues and allies who can help push. The second thing I'd like to say uh, to sum up is, is, the, is the, the fact that I'm hearing from a few voices about where that push can come from and whose push it is to make and how others can support that push. Uh, and I think it is very important, um, and as we at, uh, have learned more and more from our partnership with CGD, uh, the best uh, assistance from donor countries to our partners can often be to ask what help they need, give that help as asked, and step out of the way. So I think that's an important thing to walk away from this conversation with. The third uh, notion that I'd like to, to walk away with is uh, the, the idea of transparency and sunshine. I think uh, Mina's comment uh, that Red has allowed her, her Adat communities to be seen should really be one of the key takeaway messages from today. And I think that that is tempered uh, and seriously tempered with caution and, an, and a notion that we have not seen progress yet on the ground. And I don't think we can gloss over that. We can't just paint a happy-go-lucky, all is wonderful in the world picture. But just the step towards being seen is a critical step. And the process of RED, this engine of global climate change and global attention that is pushing in that direction, has really helped change the development prospects. And I think the, the independence, the, the, the ability of local adat communities uh, to really flourish. And I think that is the third thing that I'd like to take away from today. So with that, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for your attention. Uh, and let's give a final round of applause to our speakers. Good, thank you very much.